Good evening, everybody. Hopefully you can uh, uh, still see me and it's, uh, the sound quality is good. Uh, first of all, may I thank the 29% uh, of you that have uh, had an existing holding. Uh, hopefully uh, you came in at 22p all those years ago. Uh, I came in at 19p actually when uh, uh, the company uh, that, I, uh, that I'd started was bought by IdeaGen all the way back in uh, January 2013. So uh, I've also uh, enjoyed the benefit. Uh, not quite 1,100% return though. Um, so what I'm going to do is just talk through uh, a little bit of background on, on IdeaGen, our markets, where, we, where we've come from, where we're intending to, to go through, uh, talk a little bit about our, our products, our product pillars and our customers, um, uh, and if you like, sort of operationally what we've achieved over the last 12 months. Um, it was our financial year um, at the end of April. Uh, we released a trading update at that point, so we'll talk you through that, that trading update uh, as well. So Emma will talk through that, key numbers from this year, um, and a little bit more about uh, you know, our, our acquisitions and what we're looking to achieve on that as well. Um, and then hopefully uh, yeah, some uh, insightful questions and we'll uh, answer the best that we can. Uh, obviously, I, I will just uh, note for our compliance officer, uh, that I can only tell you so much because we don't actually release our annual results until the 22nd of July. This was only the pre-closed trading update. Um, so I'm Ben Dorks, I'm the Chief Executive. I have been the Chief Executive for uh, over three years now, uh, since 2018, having formerly been uh, the Chief Revenue Officer and Chief Customer Officer for the business. Uh, all the way back, as I said, from 2013. Uh, my colleague, Emma, is our Chief Financial Officer, uh, who joined us uh, in July, having spent three years uh, with Seven Trent uh, in a finance director position and, uh, and 10 years with Deloitte in, uh, in corporate finance, managing over, over 80 transactions. Uh, IdeaGen, uh, we're a regulatory and compliance software provider. Um, that's used. It's a it's a cloud platform that's used to meet multi-industry standards, uh, enabling organisations to manage risk uh, and compliance with their sort of relevant laws, policies, regulations. That can be everything from your ISO standards uh, through to things like SMCR, Senior Manager Certification Regime, in uh, in financial services to regulated collaboration within the, uh, the advisory marketplace. Uh, we have a very strong vertical alignment into life sciences and healthcare, which are our largest two markets, followed by financial services, uh, core manufacturing, aerospace and automotive, um, as well as being the safety management provider for um, the RSSB, the Rail Safety Standards Board for the whole of the UK, as well as managing the safety for British Airways, uh, Ryanair, KLM, Emirates, uh, amongst them as well. Um, around 2016, 2017, we moved away from being a, a traditional UK, you know, uh, small cap um, uh, software business, which was heavily focused towards uh, license sales, um, with the aim of really transforming ourselves into uh, being a SaaS business. Um, you know, we're now at a point where our recurring revenue is 83% is of the total. And more importantly, SaaS is now the largest, uh, largest uh, segment of our, of our total revenue. <clears throat> and I think what's been really impressive by that is we've done that mostly through focusing on new customer acquisition. So we've had over 550 new customer wins in the, in the last financial year alone, giving us a total of, of over 6,000 global customers. Um, we are uh, now a, a net exporter with around 60% of our revenue coming from outside of the UK and 40% inside of the, of the UK as well. And we've built a, a business uh, that has you know, acquired uh, 19 other organizations over since I was, uh, our admission to AIM in 2012. Um, but we're an active integrator. So we really focus quite heavily, as Emma will touch on in the integration piece, uh, around our one company culture. Um, 
bringing those products, those people, those customers into the idea gen uh, platform, enabling us to deliver, you know, continued double digit organic growth on our recurring revenues um, uh, and maximize the upsell cross sell potential within those organizations as well. You can imagine that regulatory and regulation and compliance is also one of those growing markets. It never gets less, it never goes backwards. Um, so we see a, you know, a really big global market opportunity in front of us. Um, yeah, when we look now, the market is predominantly Northern Europe and the US. Uh, we see growing opportunities still within those markets, but expanding opportunities as well in, in mainland Europe um, and into the uh, APAC regions. Uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Uh, I feel like Chris Whitty on a bad day. Um, when we are, <clears throat> oh, is that not the slide I've just talked my way through? I do apologize. Uh, next slide after that, uh, which is our track record of growth. I do apologize. I uh, showed you how many times I've done this presentation. I just literally went through the slide without it there. Um, so as you can see, uh, when we've been looking at our, our, our sort of in, increase in revenue, um, we've had a consistent revenue growth over the, over the last 10 years, um, all the way back from uh, around a million pounds, you know, just under a million pounds in 2010, uh, to a revenue growth this year of, uh, of over 65 million pounds um, in the last financial year. Um, and throughout that time as well, we've been really increasing our EBITDA margin, as Emma, Emma will touch on, you know, which is obviously driving a, you know, a, a continuous increase in our, our EPS um, over the time, um, you know, giving us uh, just under 6p uh, in, uh, in 2020. Next slide. So when we look at our market, we break our market down into three specific areas. Uh, the first of those is around assurance. Um, and assurance is uh, really focused for us in delivering sort of world-class quality systems. So it's around quality management solutions uh, that are enabling organizations to uh, deliver a, a, you know, a safe, legal, and most importantly, an efficient operation uh, that is, you know, delivering high quality products, um, but also satisfying regulators and, you know, in terms of uh, uh, environmental, you know, the, the, the environmental impact of that business on, on wider society. Um, our QHSE market, so the quality, health, safety, environmental, which underpins our assurance market, you know, enables us to deliver everything from your typical ISO certification. So your ISO 9001, uh, 27001. In reality, in the markets that we work, uh, it's very specific regulations. So in, in healthcare, uh, if I'm running a laboratory doing COVID testing, keeping it real, then, you know, we would be have our customers would be uh, working to ISO 15189, which is the industry standard. It's a cost of doing business for them. Um, so they're unable to get insurance to actually carry out their activities unless they have this regulation. Um, and our system that provides them with the, the framework and the context and the content to, uh, to manage that regulation on an ongoing basis, uh, giving productivity outcomes, but while also providing uh, real value in the historical rec uh, records as well. Uh, we can also break that down into safety, where, as I said, we're running the safety management systems for uh, 300 different airline operating companies uh, around the world, as many, as well as many major manufacturers, you know, managing that health and safety within their organization, you know, putting in place those in continuous improvements in uh, training and monitoring and ensuring that they, they're able to, to look after their, their global colleagues um, while also improving, you know, uh, you know remaining competitive as, as well. Uh, and we have the environmental data collection. So everything from your, your carbon efficiencies, your gas emissions, your water quality, uh, being able to collect that data uh, and be able to provide that to third party regulators as well. And that's all really wrapped up into, uh, you know, a, a sustainability approach that is enabling 
uh, suppliers and supply, supplier risk management, understanding what's happening in your supply chain, managing that risk, ensuring that your suppliers, you know, are complying with things such as, you know, the Modern Slavery Act, etc. Uh, the second part of our business is around compliance, uh, which is ensuring that organisations are, are playing by the rules. Um, so this is everything from uh, internal audit, uh, where we work with organizations such as the uh, European Central Bank, or the US Federal Reserve, um, through to uh, uh, Sands Casino uh, in Las Vegas, or Carnival Cruises, uh, or Heineken, you know, ensuring that those organizations are uh, meeting the, the standards as set out by the, the various industry regulators, but also managing the enterprise risk associated with that as well. So, you know, part of the challenge of, of these, uh, these organizations that work within a highly regulated industry is that it changes, you know, on a, on a day by day basis. Um, so there's a real, real value in ensuring the, the adherence to those ever changing industry regulations, keeping abreast of it is absolutely vital to avoid the fines um, you know, and protect your corporate reputation. We certainly see uh, we have some real, real high value best of breed solutions in our compliance arena, uh, managing everything from the senior manager certification regime, uh, which obviously was born out of the financial crisis, uh, to managing the uh, display screen equipment uh, regulation, as it's known in the UK. So understanding how people are are working in their different environments, whether that be at home um, or whether that be in the office. Uh, and finally, we have regulated collaboration, uh, which is uh, enabling teams to, to work together across a, a shared workspace. Um, primarily, uh, this, is, this is for organization, you know, for multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration. So this is not where organizations are just sharing information internally in a collaborative way. This is where organizations will be sharing with a number of different stakeholders, uh, enabling people to work, you know, anytime, any place, anywhere. Uh, I feel like that old school martini advert. Um, you know, and I think what we're looking at here is, is probably the best way of trying to imagine this. You know, there's, there's 50 plus people on this call today. Um, we all must share information, but, you know, I can only share a certain amount of information with maybe Mark. Um, you know, Emma here can only share information with Amanda. She doesn't even know Mark exists. Um, and what you're actually trying to do is enable people to still collaborate in an environment that has high levels of security, high levels of permissions, but also then enables you to have a compliance output at the end that says who's done what, where, when and how. Probably a good example of that. Is, uh, is in life sciences, for example, where, we, uh, where the system is used extensively uh, within the uh, FDA drug approval process, enabling organizations to, you know, the pharmaceutical company, the clinical research organization, the contract manufacturer, to all work together uh, without actually sharing all of the information. So um, all the way down to paragraph level permissions, um, you know, across the, the whole document repository is a, is a perfect example of that. Next slide. Um, so just a, a, a couple of, uh, of case studies, um, uh, you know, explaining really how, how those work and, and the productivity savings associated with them, because, you know, it's uh, the advantage of regulation and compliance is there's real value in uh, the historical records, you know, if something goes wrong, it's not necessarily that it went wrong yesterday at the, the National Bank of Georgia. It's that it's the fact that the, uh, the international regulators or the local regulators will be looking at that and saying, OK, in 2018, you know, we can see that you potentially laundered money. What were your your governance processes in place? What was the risk and internal control processes? Um, you know, how can you evidence to us, the regulator, that you were doing the right thing maybe three, four or five years ago? That's one of the reasons uh, as, a, as a business would be, you know, have such fantastic growth in that we have a very low churn um, uh, on, a, on a year by year basis because customers are delivering absolute value in the systems today 
but they all see, also see absolute value in the historical data within our systems as well. So just some e examples, Texicom, um, who, uh, who manufacture uh, alarm and security systems. Um, you know, they, they uh, you know, as part of a, a compliance process with ISO 9001 or 45001, and then those specific standards um, that we were talking about in terms of fire alarm quality standards and, uh, uh, you know, what does that actually mean? You know, we were, we were able to put a system in that enabled absolute compliance, but also reduced that auditing time down from, from three hours to 30 minutes, um, which had a big impact in terms of their ability to investigate far more in what was going wrong in their business. Um, you know, the, there's a, it's, there's a huge hidden cost of poor quality within many organizations. So enabling you to actually audit more comprehensively um, and produce a higher quality audit while reducing the time has a, you know, a significant, uh, you know, cost improvement, as well as obviously then creating significant revenue opportunities. Um, so we were able to deliver over £48,000 of process efficiency savings just in the first year, you know, giving a return on investment of, of less than 12 months uh, in that particular example. Uh, at the National Bank of Georgia, who use us for uh, internal audit uh, and enterprise risk management, uh, then we were able to implement uh, you know, very strong governance risk and internal control processes, um, providing, with them the, pro providing them with the ability to, uh, for example, spot fraudulent transactions, uh, particularly around money laundering uh, was one of their key criteria. They were also able to therefore spend less time with the system of doing their audits and following those audits up, which meant they were able to actually do a more comprehensive total audit of the business. Again, delivering a, a return on investment of, of just under 12 months. Uh, one of our largest customers is the Federal Aviation Administration in the US. Um, uh, the FAA, uh, you know, which we all obviously think of only when uh, when terrible things happen, actually manages all of the uh, all aspects of, of civil aviation in the in the United States, which is the, the busiest aerospace uh, in the world. Um, there's hundreds of private sector partners um, as well, uh, thousands of airports, none of which we'll have ever heard of in the in the UK, through to uh, you know, large organizations like Boeing and Airbus or large uh, airlines like Southwest. Um, and they need to be able to share information uh, between all of those, uh, all of those uh, partners, um, you know, manage procurement between those partners, share those documents out, get continuous feedback on new regulations and, uh, and what does it mean. Um, in the world of COVID, where, you know, traditionally this was lots of face-to-face -face meetings and flying around the US, um, <clears throat> being able to, to switch to a digital collaboration almost overnight um, has delivered significant uh, a significant return on investment, running into the many millions of dollars, while also actually delivering a, a, an improvement on their uh, productivity and output as well. Uh, next slide. Um, what I'm just going to, hopefully that gives you a, a, a good overview uh, of, of the business. Apologies for uh, uh, a slightly uh, uh, quick view of slide two, but I, I did talk my way through it. Um, I'll just give a quick overview on, the, on some uh, operational stuff over the last 12 months, and then I will, uh, I will pass over uh, to, the, the, uh, to Emma, our CFO, uh, to talk through uh, the financials. Uh, so the next slide. Um, so really, over the last twelve months, we've uh, we've acquired all oh, the lights have gone out in the office. Oh, there we go. They're back. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, environmentally friendly, they only stay on for twenty nine minutes. Um, uh, so we've got uh, we made three acquisitions over over the last twelve months. So we acquired Qualsys, um, uh, which is a, a, an electronic uh, quality management system, uh, which was very complementary in tech terms to what we already had. Uh, and that brought 150 customers and, uh, and 2.9 million of recurring. Uh, we acquired Huddle uh, at Christmas, literally at Christmas, the 23rd of December, uh, which supported our regulated collaboration offering. Um, 
uh, and that delivered uh, SaaS revenues of around ten and a half million pounds. Uh, and we also acquired Qualtrax in March of this year, um, which is a, a supplier of, of quality and content solutions to the US life sciences, delivering around three point six million pounds of, of recurring revenue. Um, we'll touch on those in a little bit more detail on the rationale and how they fit into the business in the M&A section, um, because hopefully in, uh, in line with what our M&A strategy is, that will make a, a lot more sense. Um, but also in the last 12 months, uh, which obviously was, was heavily affected by COVID in the, in the first part of the, uh, of the financial year in May and June, um, as, the, as, the, as the world was in lockdown, um, you know, we've had a, a really, really good year, um, really pleased with what we've achieved, um, you know, the, the, the revenue performance, the organic growth, the underlying churn have, have been great, um, you know, as we can see here, high levels of customer retention with 95% retention this year as well as last year, uh, 550 new customers in the period, um, you know, as, as, as a fantastic return. It's actually better than what we delivered in, uh, in 2019 and 2020. I think that really demonstrates the, the value that organizations see in our, our software, but also clearly demonstrates that even in, you know, even in the depths of despair of COVID, you know, organizations absolutely see value in regulation and compliance systems that deliver productivity benefits. Uh, we've had really good growth from all of our geographies across all of our three core solution areas of, of assurance, compliance and collaboration, uh, particularly in, uh, in North America. And I think, you know, <clears throat> when people talk about uh, the, you know, the, the, the SaaS and product and technology, for us, one of the biggest areas has always been our ongoing product innovation and investment. Um, around 35% of all uh, of our colleagues are involved in that technology uh, development, whether that's around um, you know, re real broad research and innovation, where we're looking at machine learning and AI technologies through to uh, you know, uh, technology debt, which is you know, making sure that it works on your infrastructure uh, and is scalable, truly scalable, or whether it's features and functions and new buttons and user experience and the user interface. Um, we've had a very long-term investment in product innovation over the last uh, three years, um, and you know, with a really strong emphasis on our cloud solutions, uh, really, really pleased with the continued uptake of that, the continued development of that, and I think that's been reflected in the you know, the high levels of retention and the high levels of, of new customers. Um, you know, I think in a, in a world that is moving, you know, digitization and industry 4.0 uh, you know, continues to evolve, that, that ongoing investment in product is, is absolutely vital. And as we go through to the end of the presentation, we'll talk about some of the significant market opportunities that we see. We've got some real structural growth drivers with uh, industry 4.0 and COVID and continued regulation and compliance, um, you know, both within the supply chain in terms of ESG and sustainability, um, as well as within some of our, uh, our own initiatives as well. Um, and I shall pass over to uh, Emma um, uh, to talk through the trading update and some of the numbers and acquisitions. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to uh, lovely to be chatting to you tonight. Hold on, we, we, oh, we have one of those stand up desks. There we go. Oh, that's look better. at that. Look at that. This looks better. Thank well, you. Well, you get a tech company. So yeah, evening, everyone. Lovely to be chatting to you all this evening. Um, I'll, I'll go through some of the um, I'll go through some of the headlines, which is, as Ben alluded to, were announced last week, and, and they're just our kind of trading updates from the year ended April. 2021. I guess in doing that, for those of you who are new to the business and still on that learning curve, we'll kind of touch on some of the key revenues that underpin a lot of the things that Ben's been talking about, really, but, but kind of how we think about the business, the commercial model that underpins everything that IdeaGen uh, does. For those of you that are holders, lots of these, um, lots of these metrics will be very familiar to you already. Um, I guess it's worth saying, look, as Ben's alluded to, really, we're really, really pleased with a, a very, very solid set of results off the back of uh, off the back of COVID, a, a really you know challenging macroeconomic 
uh, environment, but one that's really underpinned, I guess, both operationally and financially, some of the really core underlying uh, principles that, that support the business. So we've announced 65.6 uh, million pounds of, of revenue, which is great, you know, circa sort of 24, 25% growth on, on prior year. But, but what we think about more importantly than that is really about our quality of earnings. And we think about that in a, in a few different ways. First of all, uh, recurring revenue, um, that's up to 83%, up from 76% in the last year and I'll touch on the next slide but on the journey we've, we've been on over the last few years in terms of growing the level of our recurring revenue through that SaaS transition and away from away from kind of license sales and into into the SaaS world we look really closely at our ARR book so that's the annualized recurring revenue of the business on an annualized basis so it really demonstrates how much of next year's revenue is underpinned um, and as an acquisitive business, actually, what, what that starts to demonstrate as well is not only the organic growth that's coming through in terms of revenue, but also bringing in the value of acquisitions on, on a full year basis. So our ARR book was up to £69.3 uh, million pounds at the end of April. That's 50% um, sort of growth on the prior year in totality, but crucially, at a really good level, 13% organic growth on that ARR book as well. So, you know, bringing together those core structural drivers in the business of organic growth, which we are really, really focused on as well as the, the acquisition-led growth, which, um, which also really, really drives the business forward. Um, we strive to be a very profitable business. So we, we operate at 35% uh, EBITDA margins this year, which is really pleasing, and that, that equates to £22.9 million pounds of, of adjusted EBITDA. Um, we also have the benefit of being a, a cash generative business. So our, our working capital cycle is negative. And by that, I mean, as we grow, we generate more cash. We bill our customers, the vast majority of our customers are billed annually in advance. Um, and, and that gives us a very, very cash generative model. So 105% of that adjusted EBITDA was converted into cash. Um, meaning that we meaning that we have a very very strong balance sheet, which again I'll come on and talk about um, in a couple of slides time. We closed the year with a net debt of eleven million pounds. So we we did we did a share placing uh, back in just before Christmas to support um, the huddle acquisition. So we, we raised money at that point. We've also gone out to the market and, and, and raised uh, in the debt market and raised a bigger financing facility as well. But but we we have a very very strong balance sheet. Um, and again, as I say, complemented by by very strong cash from operations. So if we move on to the next slide, and, and this just gives a little bit of a, of a picture of our revenue growth and the revenue growth over the last five years. Um, so those of you who are familiar with the, with the tech world and companies transitioning to SaaS will know it is not an easy journey and not every company gets it right. What you can see in the, in the chart on the left hand side is the revenue growth and, and some of that's organic and some of that's acquisitive uh, over the last five years. But you can see that consistent top line growth, which is also reflected in, in consistent EBITDA growth as well over that period, and in fact increasing EBITDA margins. But you can see that not only is the is the is the top line growing really substantially, but but more importantly, actually probably from our perspective, is that the quality of those earnings are coming through as well, moving from fifty seven percent recurring revenue back in uh, FY sixteen seventeen through to the eighty three percent that, that we've just recorded this year. So that really means you know that, that we're in a position to grow, as Ben's, Ben's alluded to. SaaS uh, revenue now is the largest constituent element um, of our recurring revenue, uh, and we are, we are a long way through that, that really tricky um, SaaS transition. Uh, what you see on the, on the right hand side, I talked about the, the annual recurring revenue book, so the annualized position at the end of each financial year. We've got a five year CAGR there of 28%. And, and again, when you look beneath the surface, and for those of you who want to do more, more work on the idea gen story, what you will see there is absolutely a blend between acquisitive growth, but crucially year on year organic growth as well in terms of that recurring revenue growth. So, so definitely balancing. And it's something that you know we, we look at really carefully to ensure that not only are we growing uh, by acquisition, but that actually the organic growth is, is coming through as well. So a really, really positive revenue story. The next slide, please, Amanda. Uh, this is just a little bit on the on the balance sheet, so the balance sheet and cash flow. So I talked uh, a few minutes ago about the strong operating cash flow that IdeaGen has, so over 105% um, of adjusted EBITDA converted to cash in the year. Um, investment highlights, which again we'll come on and talk about a little bit more, but we acquired Crosis back in August for £2.1 million. Pounds. Uh, sorry, more than that, um, but then £2.1 million pounds spent on the group's new UK headquarters uh, here in Nottingham. In the second half of the year, investment highlights included Huddle just before Christmas and Qualtrics. 
Um, we just closed uh, literally just around the year end a new revolving credit facility. So we have a 75 million pound secured facility uh, with a 25 million pound accordion element as well. We have low levels of net debt. So, you know, less than 1.5 uh, uh, times EBITDA gearing is, is how we close the year. So a really, a really strong balance sheet to kind of grow from in the addition to the free cash flow that the business, the business generates. So we are very, very well placed to continue um, our acquisition strategy uh, funded off our own balance sheet is the plan. We take, I would say, sort of a, a sensible, pragmatic view in terms of debt funding. Um, we, we think about two times EBITDA as being the kind of maximum level of gearing that we would go to. Um, and we've used historically the markets very effectively in terms of balancing between monies raised on the market and gearing on our, on our own balance sheet. So, so we're, we're really excited about the future and about the, the next stage of our growth that, that we feel very, very well set up to deliver um, from our own balance sheet. Um, we're saying that the RCF facility was provided out as a two bank club. So we've banked with NatWest for, for many years and have a great relationship with them. But we were delighted to bring on board a new banking partner in Santander um, who, who run the race to partner partner with NatWest. So, so yeah, really, really positive and a very, very strong balance sheet from which to move forward. So Amanda, next slide, please. And I think we're going on to, to our pillar. So with that, I'll, I'll kind of hand back over to Ben. After that brief respite, Ben, you need to raise the, raise the desk. So this is the problem with being six foot three uh, and Emma not quite as tall as six foot three. <laughs> even with heels. Even with heels. So uh, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so I've got my heels on as well, so I've added a little bit. The, uh, so when, we, when we're looking at uh, our business, then we have a, a high level view focused on uh, people, products and, and customers. Um, when we, we look at that both internally, um, so you know, how can we invest in our people? How can we provide better solutions to our customers? Um, you know, how can we improve our products to further improve our customers' success? Um, and we have the same philosophy when we're looking at acquisitions. Um, you know, the, the first order in terms of how we approach an acquisition is looking at its products, at its customers, at its people. You know, do, does it fit? Do the customers overlay? Do they have good symmetry? Is it a new vertical market? You know, and people-wise, is it is it a great culture? So the pillars the pillars are are hugely important to us, and we have direct accountability in our exec teams for for each of those uh, each of those areas. Um, so I just thought I would uh, next slide, please. Uh, touch on actually this exec team. Um, you know, we've done. Uh, we've had a lot of changes over the, the last sort of twelve to eighteen months in uh, rebalancing our our executive uh, our, our board um, and the executive team as well. So um, really, to try and improve our governance, we now have four uh, non-exec directors on our board, um, uh, with only two executive directors. So I think we we certainly feel that we've got a uh, a good balance there from a from a governance perspective. Um, we also have a, an executive team uh, that is consisting of a, uh, a chief technical officer that is that is managing all of the, the core R&I and uh, uh, development, uh, chief revenue officer, um, obviously managing our, our customers uh, and our ongoing revenue, you know, ably supported by uh, a new chief people officer, um, Aaron, our marketing officer that is also doing all our product marketing, and, uh, and Barney, our chief operating officer, who he says, uh, you know, is heavily involved in all aspects of the business. Uh, we all think he just has to pick up all the stuff that we miss. So it's great having somebody to, uh, to pick up those gaps. Uh, and Barney also manages the, uh, on a serious note, the integration of the businesses that we make as, as part of our, our integration strategy. Um, so I think it's a, it's a strong, uh, robust management team, um, you know, with a lot of good experience. You know, James has come from uh, CRO of a, of a NASDAQ company, for, for example, Emma, who's you know, done 10 years at, at, of acquisitions at, at Deloitte. Um, so, you know, a really good, experienced, strong executive team uh, that have definitely been you know, one of the key reasons the business has done so well over the over the last few years. Next slide. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's not about the executive team. It's about all of our employees. Um, so I thought what we'd do is just sort of 
uh, give you some numbers and metrics on our, our employees. Um, so we have today, literally today, 710 global employees. Uh, knowing our day Jen, it'll be about 712 tomorrow, uh, as we have approximately 150 vacancies in this current financial year. Um, we, you know, we have a, a you know a, a, a really diverse workforce, so we've worked really hard on the diversity of the team. Um, you know, we've got currently 38 female and 62 male. Um, we've actually recruited 51% uh, of all new recruits in the last 18 months have been female. So we've had a very active uh, diversity and inclusion policy, um, you know, to support the, uh, the growth of the business. We have a lot of home workers. Um, uh, so around 35% of all of our global colleagues are, are home workers. Um, and we have approximately 400 that are office based across the uh, the three core locations of, of Nottingham, um, Kuala Lumpur and, uh, and Blacksburg in Virginia, which is actually where Virginia Tech uh, is based because no one would have heard of Blacksburg. You just no one knows Virginia Tech. Um, I think as well, you can really see when we look at the division of employees, uh, you know, how what the investment is when we talk about that investment into uh, development, you know, we have around a third of all of our employees are, are in development um, and around 10% of them are involved in other technology. Now, that's areas such as cyber security, uh, cloud operations are, are included in there, our research and innovation teams. Um, so if you take the total lot, there's, there's, uh, there's actually over 40% uh, involved in supporting the, the development of the products and, uh, and the ongoing uh, maintenance of, of that as well. Um, uh, we have uh, around 100 people in our customer teams. That includes customer delivery uh, and customer success. Um, you know, so that is supporting the ongoing professional services um, and the ongoing uh, recurring revenues. Um, and we have around about 150 people in sales and marketing focused on the, the sort of growth of the business. So around 25% of of all of our employees are, are involved in this sort of growing and developing the, the, the business as well. Um, as a business, we are not management heavy. Uh, we have a, an absolute policy of, uh, of, of less than 4%, uh, and that's a hard and fast rule of people in our uh, leadership team and our senior management team. Um, we're actually running at about 3.2% at the moment. Um, you know, we believe in being lean, we believe in being agile, uh, we're heavily focused on change, um, but not just talking about change, doing change uh, to ensure that we are continually fit for growth, uh, able to manage new acquisitions as they come in uh, and provide a robust, resilient uh, and stable business for the, for the future. Next slide. Uh, and then when we just look at our customers, obviously we gave you some customer examples earlier. Um, we have the uh, life sciences is our, our largest market uh, by sector, followed by healthcare and financial services uh, and, uh, and industrial utilities. Um, aviation, for example, is around 6%. So although we talk about aviation, uh, I, I know quite a lot, mainly because it's got lots of big names that everybody knows. Um, it's not a market that we've been uh, very exposed to during COVID. And actually, whether you're a passenger or a parcel, you still need to have a safety management system in place. Uh, and based upon my wife shopping from Amazon, there's definitely more parcels than people coming over from the, uh, from the US. Uh, and then when we look at uh, the revenue by geography, um, as you can see, the UK is 43%. It'll actually end up being slightly less than that this year once we've taken into account uh, the acquisitions that we've, we've made. Um, about equal now with the, uh, the US at 40% each, uh, with the, uh, the rest of the world being around 20%. So a really good split across vertical markets and across geography, and that's certainly been one of the reasons we've protected ourselves well from, uh, from the impacts of COVID. Next slide. And again. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of talk through uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of some of the, the acquisitions we've made in the, the last uh, couple of months. And I'll pass over to Air Motors to talk through the, uh, 
uh, the integration and then we'll have finished and, uh, and time for some questions at the end because I can see uh, there is some questions. Um, so as you can see, we've, uh, we've made 19 acquisitions since our admission to AIM. Um, I will quickly point out that the best one is the top left Plumtree Group uh, in December 2012, uh, although I do feel that I sold it quite cheap now, uh, looking at what revenue multiples are. Um, uh, <clears throat> that was obviously where I came from. Um, I think what's really interesting about this is that, you know, <clears throat> you can certainly see over, over the years the sort of revenue multiple arbitrage you get with, you know, buying bolt-on acquisitions and then properly integrating them together. Um, I think one of the secrets of our success as a buy and build is being our ability to not just buy businesses and, uh, and make them profitable, but to buy relevant businesses that we've integrated together into, you know, common platforms with common user experience, common user interface, common tech stack, BI reporting, um, which then we've been able to drive really significant uh, organic growth from on a year on year basis. Um, you know, and that's certainly how we uh, how we expect to continue over the next few years as we make further acquisitions uh, to really expand our, our continue to expand our, our own revenue multiples uh, and provide a you know a robust and resilient uh, product platform for, for for future growth. Next slide. So just to touch on those three acquisitions that we made this year, um, uh, August, the middle one, Qualsys, um, uh, really we bought this, it had a, it had a really uh, interesting uh, workflow module within its cloud platform uh, that we knew we would be able to integrate very quickly into the, uh, uh, the wider IdeaGen Ixa platform, which is the uh, IdeaGen common service architecture. Uh, that's the underlying architecture that, that unifies all of our applications. Uh, we were able to do that really quickly. You know, we did a lot of prep work before we acquired Qualsys. Um, we acquired that during lockdown um, as well, uh, but we'd known them for a number of years. Um, we were able to acquire that at the beginning of August, and their module was included in our product launch uh, in the middle of September. Um, you know, and that product launch has gone exceptionally well, and we've won some really high value customers, new new account customers over the uh, the following six months. And uh, you know, we have really continued to have really high hopes for for how how that's uh, how that evolves. Um, uh, we paid around twenty eight million pounds for for Huddle, um, which is a as I said, a, you know, a, a, an add on into our existing collaboration uh, tools. Um, you know, we, we continue to see an increased need for people to, to work across the extended enterprise uh, and the, the need to, to collaborate on those projects, but in, in an environment that gives you the additional security and permissions and compliance, uh, that is a, 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 an absolute base of the regulated markets in which we work, such as, such as life sciences and, uh, and aviation. Um, been really pleased with the feedback on the customers from from Huddle um, about what we've achieved and how they've how they've come into the business uh, and already had some very successful upsells. Um, the Huddle product will go out to the wider six thousand IDGen customers um, in the second half of uh, second calendar half of the uh, of the year, um, and we hope to. You know, accelerate and improve the velocity of that that customer upsell um, over these next few months. And then our most recent acquisition, which was Qualtrax, uh, which is a quality and content system to uh, a number of laboratories in the US, around 350 different clients. Um, uh, you know, <clears throat> lots of CSIs in there. So for a fan of your Channel Five, but nine o'clock CSI, uh, we have all of them. So we have Colorado. Uh, Bureau of Investigation and uh, Crime Labs. We have Las Vegas uh, Investigation and Crime Lab, um, uh, as well as the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in, uh, in the DC area. So uh, really just a, an opportunity to, uh, to, to integrate a very content-rich, uh, you know, scalable solution uh, 
um, you know, which was very much part of our, our consolidation in the global assurance marketplace. Next slide. I shall move back over to Emma, who will just talk through our acquisition rationale. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember what the one after this is. And then our integration approach, that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully just 10 minutes of questions at the end. So what are we looking for in terms of acquisitions? Well, I guess summarise on the right hand side of the three things that we're looking for. So products that we are a product based business. So crucially, uh, product is at the heart of acquisitions uh, that we look for. And when I come and talk a little bit about integration, um, the integration journey starts with products and starts with the tech stack. So really, unless we know we can integrate it and unless we know that the, the acquisitions are going to grow organically within our within our organization, that really is the first litmus test that we look for in any acquisition. So, um, so can we integrate it and is it going to enhance our, our product stack and is it going to give us access to new customers, new markets or to provide new solutions to customers that we already work with? So we're really, really looking for technological innovation with a focus uh, on extending our existing capabilities Abilities. Is it innovative and the regulatory and compliance market? So is this a product? Um, ben talked about kind of some of the functionality that we saw within, within Qualsys that we were able to, to bring in and integrate really rapidly and, and bring to market really quickly. Improved speed to market is also really crucial to us. So sometimes actually there's a product out there and actually what we know is that we can get something out to market much more quickly than we could do ourselves or actually than, a, than an acquisition target could do with their own resources because we can bring to bear whether it's commercial firepower, whether it's additional development resource to speed up the, 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 the speed to market of a, of a new product. Crucially, we're obviously looking for profitable growth. So we need to know that a business is going to grow quickly within our, within our product stack, but also that it can grow profitably. We have a good track record of taking break-even or loss-making businesses. And because we integrate so quickly and quite aggressively, we are able to turn uh, break-even or, or, or loss-making businesses. Classic example, again, was, would be, would be Qualsys. Um, and very, very quickly to take out, um, to take out costs and utilize our, our synergies to, to be able to drive profitability. Um, I talked about recurring revenue revenue being the heartbeat of our business again another of our litmus tests before we would even consider looking seriously at an acquisition is high quality recurring revenue good quality sticky revenue where we can evidence low rates of churn and customers who are happy and satisfied they're going to to continue to extend our our, our uh, lifetime value which is which is very very high so that's kind of what we're looking for and we look you know we look we look at a range of different sizes we look at different geographies you know the range of acquisitions that were on that previous slide is is really an indicator of the, of the kind of breadth of vision that we bring to our acquisition search, um, but always with these key with these key fundamental pillars in mind to make sure that we're buying buying the right things and buying things that are going to, for the long term, drive the business forward. So I'll touch just for a minute on the next slide, I think is on integration. Um, and what you see on this slide is, is just some of the areas that, that we look at. And, I, and as I sort of said, for me, integration starts a long upstream of when you complete a deal. So really you only want to, we only want to be buying businesses that we know we can effectively integrate. Um, a lot of that starts with the product and with the technology that underpins the product. So can we bring an integrating quickly and easily the technology stack? Because if you can't do that, then actually what you're left with is, is what we would term organizational debt. You're left with different development teams and you have to have and operate in a siloed way that is the antithesis of the way that we look to operate, which is one company joined up, people working fluently fluidly and seamlessly across across product sets as much as we possibly can so um, we, we look at that we look at the culture of a business people are really important is this an organization that we believe we can bring in and the, the ethos of the, of the business and the people the key people within that organization um, are going to be a good fit with our business and that again we're going to run forward successfully together um, and and you know once we've been through that kind of hygiene pre pre-completion to know that, that this is going to be a successful integration then we go to work through through the diligence and really again through upstream of completion but then lots and lots of work that happens quite quickly the first 90 days was a key we have a dedicated in-house team of, of senior people actually within our organization across technology across uh, the commercial side of things and our hr function who really have a, a role that's relatively uh, ring fenced around making sure that 
both in the first 90 days and then probably for the kind of six to nine months after that period, that we're working through rigorously all of the steps that mean that, that both in the initial period and for the longer term, any business that we buy is, is really, really thoroughly integrated. And you know, if, you, if you look across, uh, not, not just Ben, but actually if you look across lots of the senior people within our organisation, we have a good track record, actually, of key people, whether that's key product knowledge or key customer knowledge uh, that have come with acquisitions and have remained within our organisation and actually are playing really, really critical roles and, and as I say, sort of driving the business forward. So that's our approach to integration. I've, I've done a lot of M&A deals. I've sold a lot of buy and build operators. I absolutely know that a lot of the time when you lift the lid and look under the bonnet, whilst the company says they're integrated, actually, it's, it's very much a mishmash. And that is completely the opposite way that, that we that we operate. Um, but a lot of work goes into that and, and a lot of investment actually in terms of making sure that we're set up with the right people and the right processes to, to deliver that integration so and with that i think we should probably yeah we'll go to questions, go to questions. we ask the questions mark do you ask the questions how does this work Uh, thanks very much for that, Emma and Ben. I'll run through the questions. Uh, thanks for a very extensive presentation. Um, as, as it was so extensive, uh, I hope you'd be okay with extending the time a little bit so we can get a... Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks know. very much. Not how okay, I so I'll uh, kick straight off. Uh, so the first question is, who is your biggest competitor? Uh, so we don't we don't really have one, one competitor. Um, I've got hair. <laughs> um, so uh, we don't really have one competitor. We, we traditionally focus far more on the, on the mid-market. Um, just trying to take a step back. Because, because of such a long lifetime value, um, we're not swapping customers between other competitors. So customers don't move from us to a, another system. Almost all of our new customers have nothing at the moment. So they will have um, Microsoft, uh, you know, Excel and Word and SharePoint and be using Teams and all of these types of things. So, um, so you're, not, you're not actually sort of swapping uh, customers in the way that you traditionally would if you're a HR system, for, for example. The, what, what, what you actually find is that our competitors will be uh, more more geographically and vertically market focused. So if we're dealing with you know uh, med device manufacturers in in North America, we come up against Greenlight Guru. If you're dealing with aerospace supplies in the Midwest, Midwest, you come up against Tip QA. Uh, if you're dealing with mining companies in uh, you know anywhere in the world, then you, you know, you'll come up against a you know a South African company. So um, so what we actually find is specific geographical and vertical competitors rather than, than one. There are a number of US companies that are similar in size to us at, you know, circa, uh, uh, you know, 100, 100, $120 million run rate business, which is sort of what we are today. Um, uh, and uh, we come up against them, you know, infrequently. Uh, but again, primarily, they are either very enterprise level focused um, such as such as quality, or they're very specifically market focused, such as Master Control, which are now owned by uh, Sparta, owned by, by Honeywell um, in life sciences, for for example. Thanks very much. Uh, and then I'll combine two here. Um, how do you protect yourselves from uh, the risk of uh, problems arising with your so software, resulting in a, a loss by your client? and a potential claim against the business. And then the related question is, is there anything else that keeps you up at night uh, worrying about the business? Uh, well, so uh, the biggest risk that uh, pretty much any technology CEO has is, is, is your data and your cyber security. Um, we have a, an extensive team of people um, who do nothing else, but we, you know, we run continuous penetration testing on our own software, uh, as well as third-party penetration testing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious that uh, as a business, uh, you know, we hold data on internal audits on the European Central Bank and the US Federal Reserve, or we're holding safety data for most of the major airlines. Uh, we hold 
the drug approval process for GSK, for example. So uh, there are these are significant high value items, um, and you know we work continuously to do that. There's some very technical things that we do that I'm not going to tell you for obvious reasons. Um, uh, to ensure that the, the data is continuously encrypted and a whole host of other stuff and it never actually sits in one place, it's distributed and all this. Um, uh, and but we also run contract limitations. So we are, um, you know, typically we are only actually ever exposed in terms of our liabilities to uh, 10 times the, uh, the, the contract value on an annualized basis. Um, and as we don't have any one contract that contributes really more than about 1% of revenue, um, we, we are not significantly exposed uh, on, on anything. Um, so cyber and data always, you know, keep me up at night. But actually, the other stuff that keeps me up at night is probably more positive than negative. Um, we have 150 vacancies currently and uh, uh, it's a very competitive job market. So how do we get the right people, the right talent to come into our business to you know, keep us energized to enable change to, to happen at the pace that, that, that we need to. Um, you know, we're, we're really exploring at the moment, you know, new, new markets and new geographies, um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, the other thing that keeps you up at night as a buy and build is, is a bad acquisition. Um, and if you, you know, you acquire a bad one, uh, although you may not see the impact of it in terms of our financials, you know, it might be a blip, um, but a very small blip, um, the pain of that in the business can be significant. So, you know, th those are probably the, the three areas that we focus on in terms of data and cyber, you know, just the sheer growth of the business in such a very short space of time and acquisitions. Thanks for your frankness there, Ben. Um, okay, next question. Given that you're seeing accelerating structural growth drivers, are you expecting your percentage growth rate of revenues um, to be higher in the next five years than the last five years. So I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah, yeah. I was going to go for a short answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we definitely are. I mean, I guess it's worth sort of commenting that um, our headline rate of revenue growth has obviously been suppressed by the transition to SaaS. Now, that said, we, we've generally grown the ARR book. If you look on average, it's always been kind of double digit growth organically as well as, uh, and then significant double digit growth when you factor in acquisition. So I think we're really excited about the market opportunity. We think there's lots of lots of scope to, to grow quickly, but also to grow profitably as well. It's worth sort of saying that, that our, our goal is absolutely kind of double digit um, organic growth with, with acquisition growth on top of that, but also sustaining the level of, a level of profitability that kind of 35 ish percent margin which which investors have come to expect so you know and there's always could we grow more quickly if the margin was different then probably you know there, there are trade-offs to be had but but we recognize that as a uk listed entity there is an expectation both of, of growth of, of significant growth and, and we think that's a really exciting opportunity but doing that in a way that's both cash generative and, and profitable thanks then James Emanuel is asking whether you're considering a, uh, a New York listing, a dual listing in addition to the London one, as you have significant US operations. No. Is it on the cards? No. More, we, 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 <clears throat> no. <laughs> okay. No, we're doing more transatlantic flights. I've just had COVID, I managed to get out of flying for the first time in 20 years. I'm oh. younger, I'm 10 years younger now. Great. Uh, and then Bob asks, um, I mean, you, you quoted a, a revenue multiple for your recent acquisitions. Um, do you look at the P multiple as well? Um, typically, what, what P do you pay for, for your acquisitions, assuming they're profitable, that is? So, well, I guess we think about, we think about kind of multiples in, in different ways. So, Definitely in the current market, and there's no doubt that ARR multiples are the, are the key driver of the way we think about valuation. We think about more kind of EBITDA multiples, I think probably, and then we're always looking for, for acquisitions that are earnings enhancing as well. So I think we kind of have a range of metrics. We wouldn't want to pay, for example, more than sort of 10 times EBITDA in the, in the first full year of trading. And then we're looking for, as I say, kind of earning, earnings acquisitive, uh, um, earnings acquisitive, earnings, earnings enhancing. Accretive. And it's a creator, thank you. Um, I was looking for that A word, um, transaction. So I think, look, I think we triangulate the various data points and make sure that, that it makes sense across all of them. And we have sort of 
very, very Jean expert, very, very well developed um, ways of looking at things. But equally, each acquisition we look at on its merits and, and you know, we, we look to buy as well as we possibly can. Um, and depending on the strategic value of each acquisition, then, you know, we make a, we make a judgment call. I think I think the, the point to make on this, Mark, is that lots of the organisations that we buy are small owner managed businesses and they're, they're run for dividends, not for profit. Um, yeah, and so we have to take a very different view. So, you know, for us, for us, absolutely, it, you know, it always has to be uh, earnings accretive, but it's, it's, more, it's more about what we are going to be able to do with it. You know, ultimately growth is the number one driver for us. You know, it's quite easy to acquire uh, assets that you can financially re-engineer into something that looks great on paper. Uh, but as Emma alluded to, um, is then just you know a bunch of companies under one big umbrella that don't understand or talk to each other or join up. Uh, I could certainly give you a couple of examples in the in the US where that's the case. Um, you know, our view is we we're ultimately buying an asset to drive organic growth um, uh, across the whole you know across the whole business, and you know we've been very successful in doing that. We believe that delivers the the highest return for for our investors and our shareholders. Um, you know, rather than just buying cheap assets and hoping that you know the revenue arbitrage happens because of scale, not because of execution. Um, that's that's a hope rather than a, a, what actually happens. Okay. Uh, then we have time for one last question here. There are, there are a few others which we don't have time for, so I hope it's okay if we send those through to you and we could perhaps. Of course. Yeah post them the answers on our website. Thank you. Uh, so the final one is uh, when you raise new equity, uh, do you give individual shareholders the opportunity to participate in any capital raisings? Yeah, we, we absolutely do. We use, and the name's gonna come out of my head. Um, Primary bid, thank you very much. So we did, we did, we put a, we put an element of the of the fundraise out through primary bid, which was you know heavily oversubscribed, as was the, the main um, placing as well. So, but we were delighted. I think everybody who bid for shares through primary bid got an allocation. I think maybe got what they asked for as well. They did, they did, we, you know, we got a good level of appetite and we were able to serve that appetite in a way that that felt very fair and very equitable because you know we are very cognizant as a board that that private investors and, and the shareholder base, you know, um, that, that you guys represent um, has been a really important part of our journey to this state. And we, you know, we don't take that for granted and, and we are very, very keen. And, and, you know, as well as it being part of just good corporate governance, it's also really, really important to us to make sure that, that we, um, you know, that we work with and reward uh, the, the holders who've been with us for, for many, many years. Uh, and I can just call on. I will just answer one of the questions, if I may. Um, just because it's easy to answer. Uh, Dave, David uh, obviously was ex chair, uh, our executive chairman. Um, it's been very much a planned move of David retiring over the years. Um, we announced it obviously in January. We we then announced David's you know formal departure in in May. Um, you know, and David is 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 retiring to going explore other things. I know he's, you know, owns an alpha sock company and or some, something now. And uh, I know he's, uh, he's building a new house and, uh, you know, uh, great good luck to him for the future. He's been, uh, you know, gave me a chance when nobody else would. Um, you know, and uh, it's been a you know, certainly very a, 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 amicable and well-planned uh, changing of the guard and, and genuinely believe that Richard is our new non-executive chairman having taken Aviva through from 45 million to 1.4 billion is uh, the right man to lead us through what you know, we hope is a similar, similar journey over the next, uh, next three to five years. Thanks very much for that. And I just want to corroborate what you said before by saying my own experience as a shareholder has been that, that uh, IdeaGen has always gone the extra mile to um, respond to, to its individual shareholders and, and take account of their their concerns as well as those of your institutional investors, which is something we're really grateful for. So thanks very much, Ben, Emma. Great to see you again and hope to see you again soon. Great, to, great to meet you all and hopefully 29% comes 49%. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>